30 years ago, Paul Stewart scored for Tottenham in the FA Cup final against Nottingham Forest, an equaliser that stirred the side to a victory, ultimately overshadowed by a career-changing injury to another Paul, a certain Mr Gascoigne. That sunny afternoon at the Old Wembley was quite probably the high point of a career that had begun at his local club, Blackpool, moved on to Manchester City, and after having played over 100 times for Tottenham, to Liverpool, where injury prevented him from a sense of real fulfilment. I'm Neil Harmon. And I'm John Richardson. In the past five years, when the extent of the horrendous extent of the abuse of young players in the 1980s became known, Paul, who carried those scars with him throughout his professional career, has become a passionate advocate for the protection of children and spoken widely to young players on a deeply personal level. His contribution to the documentary Football's Darkest Secret was particularly courageous. This week, he launched Safeguarding in Sport, an online course to provide individuals and associations with the practical tools to ensure commitment to excellence in safeguarding young athletes. Paul, a very warm welcome to the Old Spice Boys podcast. It feels as though we've been here before, but anyway, we're very grateful to you for, for sparing the time I want to congratulate you again for speaking out so bravely on so many difficult subjects. Uh, maybe yeah, we could, friends, John. Yeah, it's matching to see you, mate. And maybe we could, we could talk, you. talk about your football career first and give us a sense of kind of how you fell in love with the game and those those boisterous days as a kid in Blackpool. Well, it was I was actually born in Manchester, uh, Neil, in a place called Withinshaw. Uh, oh. Came off a, a council estate. Um, your only release, I guess, was football. Manchester back then, you were either a red or a blue, um, and you would emulate the, uh, you know, your favourite players. And but we would play football from morning till it went dark, till you know whether our mum called us in for tea or dad called us in, and every spare minute was football, football, football. And you know, I was, I, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. So why Blackpool, Stewie? How how did that arise? Well, uh, I joined a team in Manchester. Uh, we used to call it Sunday League then, John. It, it's now yeah. grassroots football, but it's it, it was called Sunday League football then. And the coach that was in charge of the club that I joined was associated with Blackpool FC. So, naturally, but Blackpool were then in the second division, you know, they had players like Mickey Walsh playing for them, you well, know. Yeah. They, they, were, they were quite a big team, so... You know, going to Blackpool. Uh, you know, I, I just, I just enjoyed it from from day one, really. And of course, you came across a certain Sam Ellis, uh, a bit of a hard man, wasn't he in those days, Stewie? Oh well, yeah. I mean, he came from Watford. He was only young, relatively young. You know, uh, Graham Taylor allowed him to come and speak to Blackpool. He took over, and. He was instantly good with the younger players, but very, very disciplined with us. You know, I mean, um, he was a hard taskmaster, taskmaster, as they say, but probably gave you the, the tools that you needed to, to grow up in that era. Because when you joined a football club as an apprentice, you know, you had to become a man very, very quickly. And certainly Sam, being as disciplined as he won, was helped you to to adapt as quick as possible to the to the game in the lower divisions which was very tough and i think you you've you've maintained contact with him since something you you, you still yeah, see I him I, I went around last saturday uh, for a coffee with him during the lockdown we uh, we went for walks you know when we could um always always in contact with him you know forever Forever grateful for what he uh, what he did for me, not just as a footballer, but for you know as an individual. You know, he taught me the right principles. I think, I hope, and cool. uh, you know, I, I, I yeah, of course, I still remain friends because he just lives up the road anyway. That's great. That's great. And and then on to then on to to Main Road. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I, I never thought. You know, I started to think that it was going to pass me by at one point. Um, a lad that I joined Blackpool with from the same team, David Bardsley, he got a move to Watford. Um, yeah. mm. And you know what it was like back then? You used to look at the papers on a Sunday, 
Yeah. And there'd be a column, there would be a column in there talking about who was looking at who, you know, what clubs were interested. And mine was linked with with a lot of clubs, but nothing came to fruition, you know. And I started to to get that sinking feeling that maybe it passed me by. But City was struggling in the uh, in the old first division, and I was I was banging goals in left, right, and centre that season for Blackpool, and they were short of a striker. So they came and knocked on the door and uh, ended up buying me for uh, around 300 grand, I think it was, which for Blackpool back then was life-saving money. You know, yeah. they'd, earned, they'd earned 250 off David Barsley, then within a year, another 300 grand, and it kept the club afloat. So, you know, it was, it, I suppose it was, it was good for both parties. Yeah. Neil and I, you know, remember those days as well, Stu. We remember it a far different club to it is now. A, a couple, it's fair to say, shady characters, um, Peter Swales and Freddie Pye. Maybe that's yeah, doing well, a little yeah, service, but, yeah, you know. The... <laughs> yeah, to, to be honest with you, I went over for talks and, you know, bizarrely, I ended up going over uh, on more than one occasion and... When I went, when when Sam told me that I had to go over to speak to uh, Manchester City, I got to the ground to Main Road and the big grand entrance there, and there was a load of pressmen there, and they took me straight onto the pitch. I had a shirt on with a scarf, pictures taken. Then I went upstairs, and they took me off for a medical. And I thought I felt like. It was a bit strange because I hadn't even spoken to the manager about terms or anything. Anyway, eventually I got in with uh, with Jimmy Frizzell, who was the, the manager then. And, and, and in his office, there was the old manager's table and there was this old, horribly scruffy, leather brown settee. And yeah. sat on it was this man who I didn't know at the time with his hands down his trousers in a, in, in a bedraggled suit. I then learned that it was it was Freddie Pye, a character from Manchester scrap metal dealer, who was who was quite quite big in in, in City uh, oh. at City as one of the directors. But I think he was there just to to go back and forth to Pete Swales. But I uh, when they offered me uh, the deal, it wasn't much more than I was on at Blackpool, and I thought I'm going up from the third division to the first division, and I think they offered me maybe a hundred pounds more than I was on. And I just, I just said, I was thinking, I was thinking of a bit more than that, you know, being a Manchester lad, no agent, didn't really know how to put it that I wasn't happy with it. And I just said, I was thinking a bit more than that. And then Jimmy's saying to me, well, son, you're coming to Manchester city, you know, this could be a massive stepping stone for, you. we're not prepared to pay anymore. And that was it. So I drove back to Blackpool thinking, what have I done? I've just turned Manchester City down. Um, that's it now. Get back to Blackpool and obviously the club are not too pleased with me because I haven't I haven't accepted the deal and they've not got their money. And I was just devastated. And then I get the, the, the morning paper through the door the next morning and I did... I, to be honest with you, I didn't even have a morning paper on order. That's that's how uh, how bizarre it was. But they decided to post one through that said "Greedy Stewart" on the back, which compounded it even more. And what happened from there was City kept losing, I kept scoring, and, and without you know making the story too long, I was away at uh, Northampton, and me and a, a, a God, Eamon O'Keefe, who used to be at Everton, came. We both scored a hat trick, and, and Tony Buck and Jimmy Frizzell were waiting in the tunnel for me, and and they said, "Look, you know, what is it you're looking for?" And I think I got another hundred pound on top of it. It wasn't, it, you know, it was, I think I went from two fifty to four hundred pound a week. To be honest with you guys, which yeah. you know back then was obviously a lot of money, but um, they agreed to it, and that's how I ended up joining uh, joining Man City. And initially, it was quite a struggle, wasn't it, Stewie? That, yeah, um... they bought me, to, bought me to score goals, uh, John. And they were, to be honest with you, the bit time I'd gone there, I think there was something like six, seven games to go, and they were languishing, they were losing every week. I didn't, 
I didn't start like a house on fire. Um, so unfortunately, we ended up being relegated to uh, to Division mm. Two. They moved Jim Jimmy Frizzell upstairs uh, as general manager and brought in a young uh, coach called Mel Machin from Norwich. And what his first signing was a lad called Tony Adcock. Mm. Now they already had Imre Varadi, who was the senior player. So in pre-season. It looked, for all intents and purposes, like I was going to be the uh, odd man out. And what I did, I just worked. I worked as hard as I possibly could. And fortunately for me, but not for Tony, he got a knee injury. So I started playing in the um, in the preseason games, and everything I touched just went in the back of the net. So Mel couldn't really drop me, and. I then went on that season, I think, in all comps to score 30 goals. So, you know, uh, Tony's misfortune at the time was obviously uh, was my fortune. And I, I, I grabbed it with both hands and, and, and scored a lot of goals. There was that memorable match, wasn't there, against Huddersfield where you won 10-1. That's and you, right. got a hat, you got a hat-trick in that. So, uh, yeah, City... three was three yeah. scored a hat-trick, John, didn't we, if you remember rightly? And... Uh, it, I tell you what was good about that in, in so certainly in, over the last few years is every t when Huddersfield were in the uh, in the Premiership, yeah. the three of us would get invited to the home game, get wined and dined, free this, free that, looked after like <laughs> kings. I've not heard from them since they've gone down. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, it was it was a memorable game, and do you know. It was one of them games, and you don't often get it, where you've got 11 players on the pitch and they were all at it. They were all at the mm. races. So, you know, sometimes you might have nine and a couple not not, not quite on the game or eight. This day, to a man, everyone was, uh, was, was, was on the game. So, you know, we just, we just relished. Um, and like I say, myself, David White, Tony Adcock scored, uh, scored three. But back then, you know, the match balls, they, you know, they, they would yeah. give a match ball away if they scored a hat trick. But there wasn't enough money around to give three match balls. So, <laughs> believe it or not, the, the match ball went to Paul Simpson, the winger, because he set <laughs> a lot of the goals up. But, we, but the, you know, the club, was, the club was like it was. And, and, and you, you know, nowadays, you know, they'd be... You know, there'd be uh, three match balls and everything uh, everything would yeah. be there. But back then, you know, even even when it went over the stadium, they used to have somebody that was patrolling <laughs> around the stadium to bring it back in, you know what I mean? And God, how times have changed, yeah. eh? There'd be panic on, wouldn't there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Cert certainly, God rest his soul, Bernard Alford, who was, yeah. who was he'd tell yes. he would panic, <laughs> would panic if the ball went missing. <laughs> You think if you think about it, and that, that it was a bit of a ramshackle club, wasn't it back then? It was a it was a wonderful club to to, to write about and to be yeah. a, associated with because they were so welcoming. But you had to peel away the curtains, and my, you know, it was you, you had to wonder how it ever yeah, I mean, how it ever you know, it went from week to week and survived. Yeah, and do you know what? I mean, Peter Swales was was you know. I don't know, a, 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 a dodgy character to say the least, shall we say. But you wouldn't have wanted his hairdresser, would you? That's for a No, story. you wouldn't. Have. But do you know what? The truth is, the truth is, if you cut him open, it would say Manchester City and he'd have blue yeah. blood because he was he was so so um, passionate about the club, but it was just the way that he went about um, doing business for the club. And I mean... Do you know, I, I when I eventually moved on to Spurs, um, he was writing in the paper that I'd asked to move and that, you know, I was forcing the issue and blah, blah, blah. When I never even asked for a move. They were offered 1.7 and they were never going to turn it down. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, it was just the way he conducted business and, and could have conducted it, surely, in a, yeah. in a better way. But there were a lot of characters around them. One, he had Bates from Chelsea. You know, you've had yeah. Yeah. different chairmen at different clubs, and, and, and there were there were some of them were um, maybe passionate, but they're not very clever in the way that they conducted business and the way that they looked after the players and the staff. 
yeah but they were real weren't they 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 yeah they were supporters of the club and like you know a lot Most now it's, yeah yeah so what would what would we rather have i don't know <laughs> probably i know probably yeah, it's them, a probably them with money yeah yeah poss possibly but it's um it's you know it's what it was it what the game was that wanted john you know it yeah. wasn't uh, you know it wasn't specifically manchester city where there was dramas uh, now and again there was you know there was a few other clubs you had Leeds like I said you had Chelsea and uh, you know even when I went to Spurs we had Irvin Scholar didn't we that, that yeah. you know pe people used to um, look at and, and, and think that he was less than honest I got on with him great you know Irvin but you know it, it was what football was in them days mm. So the move so, to the move to Spurs comes around, and the, what was your immediate sense when you heard the the money involved and the the opportunity that was presented to you then, Paul? Well, to be honest with you, I never I never thought about moving down south, Neil, because, um, like I say, I was a northern lad. The only time I'd been down south would be to have played for Blackpool or Manchester City, and obviously you didn't stay and you came back, and there was no doubt that there was a north and south divide. Um, but, you know, Venice was the first one to stump up the money. Um, yeah. Everton did stump up the money afterwards. So I jumped on a train and, and went down to the big lights. I went to Kensington in this uh, hotel called the Royal London, walked into the bar area. There was a bottle of champagne on the bar. Venice was there, a lad called Ted Buxton. Yeah. And he, just sold the, he just sold the club to me, yeah. Do you know. Um, and that's what he could do, you know. He was a charmer, and I actually shook hands on the deal there and then, but asked him to keep it quiet because I was getting married the, the following weekend. And then City, uh, City uh, Everton came in for me, and I, I did go over and speak to them out of courtesy, but I'd already shook hands on a deal, you know, on a deal with um, with Venice, and off I went down to the. Um, the bright lights of uh, London. <laughs> so yeah. a nice, a nice wedding present, then, eh? Nice yeah, wedding. well, it was, it was, it was a bit daunting because, like I say, I was young, I was a, a, a northern lad, and it was very daunting. But you know, I, you know, as I said, well, I signed on the Saturday, and a certain uh, Paul Gascoigne signed the next day. So Venice was showed intent that he wanted to, he wanted to bring a good team. And make a good team, you know. Uh, and I think it was after the era of Ozzy and Glenn and mm. Ricky, you know, they needed to rebuild. There was players there like Gary Mabbott, Chris Waddle, you know, and uh, we were brought in. So it looked like a really, really good move on paper for me. And as I know myself, because obviously uh, I was doing Gazza's column at the time, hence mm. the grey the gray hair. Um, <laughs> Oh, you hit it off immediately with him, didn't you? And sort of became, well, a little bit of a minder. Is that fair? Yeah, say? yeah. I mean, we, back then they'd put you in a hotel um, and you had a certain amount of time where you would stay in a hotel and try and find uh, a house to live in. So obviously both of us were in, were in the hotel. And uh, yeah, it was quite eventful, but you know, sort of became his mind without being asked to. Really, you know, it was like looking after a baby, as you as you know. But you know, as a talent, he was phenomenal. Was that the first hotel before you got kicked out of the second one? No, the second one we got kicked out. The first one um, that was in Loughton, wasn't it? I can't remember yeah. what it was called, but we uh, yeah, well, Gazza used to. Gazzy I mean, was shoot, shooting sparrows, wasn't it, or something like that? <laughs> no, he, he just used to invite all everyone from Newcastle down and sign sign the checks for them, and then there'd be riots at night, um, <laughs> fire extinguishers going off, and all sorts of early hours of the morning. So we were polite, politely asked to leave. So we ended up in Waltham Abbey, where we were no karma, I must say, but they just <laughs> they just put up with us. So was it a bit of a rush to get a house then for you? Um, I was probably in there about three or four months. You know, it wasn't oh. it wasn't a great rush because my wife was reluctant to move, um, and and yeah, it was it was it was quite daunting to be honest for a youngster back then. And I know yeah. 
I'm not complaining because listen, football gave us a, a great a great living and we were we we were privileged to be in the positions we were in but you know it's still daunting when you move from from like the north to the south um not really knowing anyone oh you know i had my teammates but you know family wise it's difficult you have to sort of create a life for yourself and that's no mean feat when you're moving from the north to the south but that Tottenham side was a uh, was was full of invention, wasn't it? It must have been a thrill to to play in it. I and mean, if you had if you had say Waddle and you had Gaza and just, just fantastic players to 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 be a part of, to be to be teammates. Do you know what it was as well, Neil? We were entertaining. Now we could win four three or get beat four three. You, you know, there was always yeah. goals. There was always excitement. You know, when you you, you name some of the pl other players that were in there: Gary Mabbit, Naeem, Paul Allen. You know, there were players in there and as a, as a team, we were never going to threaten for the league title because we were never consistent Listen, enough. But what yeah. we did, we we always entertained. And, and and you know what? Part of the Tottenham fans loved that. They loved the fact that they were being entertained and it wasn't it wasn't so much uh, the result um, as it is now, more the, the entertainment and by... Did, did did the lads entertain us in some of the games? And of course, the 1991 FA Cup final, Paul, you know, where you played a huge part in that. Often remembered, of course, for Gazza's outrageous assault on Gary Charles, which, you know, did his knee in. And then um, off you went in the coach, wasn't it, to present the cup to a stricken Gazza in his hospital bed? Yeah, I mean, what had happened then? I mean, to be fair... We played the first round proper here in my uh, where I live now in Blackpool. It was a, a windswept, rainy Bloomfield Road where it was. The conditions were absolutely awful, and I say often that it could have gone either way. You know, um, Gaza swings a ball into the box, Lineker headed it down. I just swung my left foot, at it and we we got a one nil win. But as I said, you know, we could have got beat one nil with the conditions. But I think from then. You know, one would one would have to admit that Paul probably took us all the way to the final. Um, some incredible performances, and then that goal in the semi-final. Yeah. Um, he'd, he'd agreed to go to Lazio before the final. The deal was done, and as you say, there was that that moment of madness um, whereby he, he, he injured his knee, but. You know, I look at the referee and, you know, we, we've talked about it before. He should have probably booked him for an earlier challenge where he um, mm. assaulted Ian Wong at chest height with his, uh, you know, it's more like a Kung Fu kick than a than kicking a football, wasn't it? Now the referee didn't see that as a booking, I don't know. So he just went launching in at uh, Gary. And I, did, I don't think we knew straight away that he was going to go off. I don't think. But then... When he got up and he was gingerly jogging and went down again, there was no doubt that, you know, he was going to have to leave the field of play. And what happened was Piercy scored an unbelievable uh, free kick from the from the foul. So, you know, and they'd been our bogey side that season, you know. We, we'd lost to them in, I think, in the quarterfinals of the old Milk Cup or yeah. uh, Carlsberg Cup, whatever it was. They'd... They beat us by the odd goal in the league. So, you know, when we went one nil down, it was it was looking looking not so good for us with us losing Gaza. But, you know, thankfully, thankfully we uh, well I got oh, the equal. Yeah, superb goal. It was a good. Goal. And I think we looked we looked stronger once we got the equaliser, and we I I felt them that if anyone was going to win it in the you know, in playing time as opposed to penalties, then it would be uh, would be ourselves. I mean, back then probably would have been a replay, wouldn't it? But yeah, uh, we we were definitely the stronger from then on. And 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 Des, unfortunately for him, yeah. um, well, got into yeah. his own net, so we we we, we end up winning two one. So in the during the celebrations, obviously in the dressing room. Who made that decision then? Well, we'd better include Gazza in there. I think Terry asked me. And he said, Paul, shall we take the trophy to... I can't remember what the name of the hospital was. It was Pr just Princess, Princess, Princess Grace. 
that's the one uh, off Marlebone Road, and and we walked in and handed him the cup. You know, he was there on the bed. He'd he'd had the nurses coming in and out telling him what was happening. Um, so yeah, you know, I think all the players all the players wanted to do it. And I think it was because, as I said to you, after the first game, the you know the fourth round proper, it was really all down to Gaza why we got there. So I think I don't think any of the players sort of would have begrudged us taking the trophy to to the Princess Grace and presenting it to him. And what was his mood? Was he was he a bit panicky about what had happened to him or was he prepared to celebrate? I don't, I don't, yeah, I, well, he was always prepared to celebrate, but I don't <laughs> think they, I don't think they knew the extent then of his injury. Right. You know, because they do scans and everything, don't they? And back then medical uh, probably procedures weren't like they are now, you know, they whiz them in and they can, they can do everything and, and, and find out almost instantaneously. But so he wasn't a hundred percent sure, but the, the physios, I think sort of knew because of the way he was running, you know, he was able to mm. run in a line, but as soon as he turned either way, they knew that, that you know, he collapsed. They knew it was, uh, it was damaged to his cruise ship, but they didn't know the severity of it. When you think a, tal a, a talent really unfulfilled in so many ways, what, what he what he could have gone on to achieve had that not happened. I mean, it's, everything is had something not happened. They could have been they could have been very different. But mm -hmm. for someone like Gaza, it was such a such a shattering blow to him. Yeah, I'm, I, I, you know, I always say, you know, when you look at the '91 season, you know, take the FA Cup aside. If you look at the actual league season, you see some of the performances that he put in. You know, I played in a game against Derby County where they, they've got the England goalkeeper beat Shilton in the net and we uh, we beat them 3-1 and he scored three free kicks from the edge of the area and put them in different places in, you know, against England's number one. So, you know, that season, I always say, I think he was the best player on the planet. Yeah. Uh, none. But as you say, you know, um, whilst he did recover and go on to have a successful career because he still won trophies at Rangers yeah. yeah play at Lazio do you know I think there was a lot more that he could have given to to football had he not had he not sustained that 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 knee injury yeah but full credit to you Paul you know you became his minder but yourself you were hiding this horrible secret weren't you that uh, you've been abused as a, a young player at Blackpool and you know, you hadn't told anybody. You you were playing at the top of your game, which was absolutely amazing and full credit to you. But it it must have been so traumatic for you. Yeah, and I think as I alluded to earlier on, John, it was the coach from the Sunday League team that abused me. Um, so yeah, I, I I to be honest with you, I thought I'd blocked it out. I thought I'd put it to the back of my mind, but. You know, I now realise that it manifested itself in in, in, in many different ways. You know, I've, I've, I've struggled with, well, I've been addicted to Class A drugs on two occasions where I've had to seek help. You know, I was taking drugs and drinking a lot towards the end of my, my time at Spurs. Um, and I just, you know, I, put, I used to put on this, this mask and cloak and pretend mm. that I was... I was, you know, successful in what I was doing, that I was happy. I used to go in behind closed doors on my own and I was just dying inside and, and uh, you know, suffered from depression and suicidal thoughts. And it was just, it's just, you know, and I, I look back and I played, I played in that cup final uh, and scored a goal, played for England. Uh, they should have been the two happiest times of my life, yeah. but yeah. I didn't enjoy them. I didn't enjoy them at all. And, uh, yeah, it subsequently, uh, it, when I joined Liverpool, the, the drugs carried on. And I know that you say in your uh, intro that it, through injury, but to be honest with you, I wasn't taking care of myself in any way, shape or form. And, and one can't be playing at the top when you're taking drugs and drinking as much as I was um, during my time at Liverpool. And that I'll always regret because... I genuinely think I could have gone to Liverpool and uh, 
I, I, I played, I think, 32 games maybe. I think I could have played 332 and, and, and done really well there. But I completely... Um, I completely gone by then, and and I was I was doing things off the field that I, I shouldn't have been. So was, going was, back to going back to those horrendous early days, Paul. I mean, both Neil and I know know you, and always thought of you as you know very well, quite a hard man in many respects, in the nicest sense. You know, great mm. to deal with, but but little did we know what was going on, you know, behind closed doors, if you like. Was and. People say, "Well, why why did he let it happen?" But you wanted to be a footballer, didn't you? And yeah, that, might have, that might have been taken away from you. Well, yeah, you know, there, 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 as you know, I do a lot of work in safeguarding now. But um, people ask that question often, and you know, I always talk of the three stages of not saying anything. Do you know when I was ten, just nearly eleven, and the abuse started? We've got we've got a, a middle-aged man saying, "If you say anything." He'll kill your mum and dad. Mm. You then think, you know, my parents were getting gifts. My brothers, uh, my two older brothers were getting the latest sportswear, which we could uh, ill afford. Uh, I thought if I tell my dad, my dad will kill him. But I think uh, the most, the biggest reason you don't say out, because you think that this individual has the power to give and take away the only thing you ever wanted to be, and that's to be a footballer. Then you move on in your career, and when you're an apprentice, you know, and it was growing up in a tough world, you know, you didn't want the coaches to think you were a, a problem kid. So, and you are, I'd, I'd also thought I'd dealt with it. I thought I'd put it, you know, I thought I'd take yeah. the story to the grave. I thought I'd put it to the back of my mind. And then when I when I go on to be, uh, to play at the top, um, you know, and I'm sat next to Lineker or Rush or Barnes or Gascoigne or Mulby, you know, it's embarrassing for a 24-year-old to to say, by the way, this happened to me as a as a child. So you end up finding reasons not to come forward and say something. And and that's how I did it. And like I say, I thought, I thought until November 2016, I was going to take this story to my grave. The, the, there was no one around at that stage then, Paul, that you felt comfortable enough or confident enough that you could take them into your confidence and say, look, just to, just to let you know, if you think I'm, th this is why I'm, I'm going off the rails a bit, this happened and that happened, it, there just wasn't any, any, any support mechanism there. There was no, there were, and listen, there was no such thing as duty of care. There was no safeguarding officers. But, do you know, and we talked earlier about back then playing football, um, if you showed a sign of weaknesses around the changing room, then, you know, you could become a target. Managers would look and think, oh, you know, he's not got the strength of character or, or something like that. And, and and you think of all them things and, and, and gives you reasons not to say anything, Neil. As, as you well know, I still speak to Sam. And when I came forward in 2016, after I met up with him, he said, you know what, lad? If you'd have said something, I would have got rid of him. I'd have, you know, I'd have got rid of him out of the club. Um, we would have believed you because that's another thing, you know. It's mm. will people believe? Yeah. Because these people are, uh, you know, they're the nicest people in the world. And do you know what? 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 This coach brought two of us to to Blackpool Football Club, who ended up earning the club nearly uh, five hundred thousand pounds in sales. So, do you know? Did they turn a blind eye as well at some point, possibly because I can't believe there wasn't rumours? But do you know they look at the, the, the money that saved the club, and I know that's not the right thing. But do you know, as a, as as I've I've sort of processed it all over the the last few years, I've looked and thought, yeah, it's got to be somebody must have have, have, have thought something wasn't quite right, um, and. Maybe they just swept it under the carpet because of the money that they they received, certainly from us too. You what speak the, very, you speak very sorry. Speak very uh, well about your time at, at Liverpool, and you know that it didn't work out for you. And um, we now know the reasons. Has anybody since spoken to you about it, Paul, and said, "Oh well, yeah, we we now have sympathy." You know, I, think, I, I, yeah. I mean, no, Paul I mean, Walsh. I mean, I, you know. Yeah, well, I mean. 
I still speak to some of the lads, Rushy and Walshy, as, 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 as you probably know. Um, we don't really discuss my time there. You know, when I came forward, you know, Robbie Fowler and Rushy and Walshy, they were amongst the first to, to come forward and make sure I'm all right. But, you know, it wasn't about sort of talking about and, 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 and going on about the, the reason that I didn't do it. Because I'm, I suppose for me, John, I'm, I'm an honest man. Or I like to think I'm an honest man. And as much as I had gone off the rails, nobody forced me to take the cocaine. Nobody poured the drink down my neck. You know, I chose to do that myself. So I have to look back and say that as much as I regret it and there were reasons, nobody really forced me to to do that. And, you know, I have to live with the fact that, you know, it's one of the biggest regrets. You know, the, the move to Liverpool was fabulous. You know, back then, two and a half million pounds just broke into the England squad. Um, and back home in the north, it just it couldn't be any more perfect. And uh, I end up, I end up, uh, I'd already started the drugs when at the end of my spell at Spurs. And I, I you know, little does everyone know, I was almost on cocaine every day of the week when I was at, at, at Liverpool. And, uh, you know, I regret that so much and it'll always remain one of the biggest regrets because you do well at Liverpool and, and you know, that crowd, them, the people of that at City, you know, you, you can be a legend forever. What, what, what was the, the, the moment, Paul, when you just said, you said in November 2016, when well, I, I just can't keep this, I just can't keep this inside me anymore. I have to tell somebody that this this happened to me. What, what, what was the... Uh, what was the moment the was reading an article. I read an article in a newspaper, Neil. Um, I was at work. I used to get in work quite early. I'd get rid of, I'd, I'd do all the emails, get rid of the, the business I had to do before the staff come on. And then, and then I'd read, um, I'd read the, the newspaper online, the Daily Mirror. I used to go through it, start of the sport, really. But then I'd go through from the from the front and about three pages in there was an article from a footballer that had suffered abuse uh, when he was a youngster um, by a football coach but it was just like you know it's almost like reading your own story and I just felt compelled because the lad that came forward hadn't really played at the top I thought it could easily become yesterday's news this so i just felt compelled to support him and i knew because i played for england because i played for uh, city and liverpool and tottenham amongst others i knew that the story would be would be big and and i decided then that i should come forward and and, and, and in support of the uh of, of andy that came forward yeah. first yeah. Andy, i didn't andy expect really yeah i didn't expect the tsunami of individuals to follow me I really didn't, you know, and, and maybe that's naive of me, um, but I, 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 you know, it affected every corner of, of, of the country and, and, you know, it didn't, no, no, nowhere escaped it. And yeah, it, you know, it, it's, and I suppose, you know, one of the, one of the things I say often is it, it, it made people understand me a lot more. Do you know, my, my, my family didn't understand when I didn't speak to them or when I went missing for days on end and why I would drink as I drink, as I drank and why I wasn't there for special birthdays because I'd gone missing or I wasn't outside school like like all of the other dads. I'm not, again, it's not an excuse, this, but they understood the reasons a little better. Yeah. And look, my kids were my kids were so annoyed because they felt that somebody had taken their childhood away from them as well because of the way that the, the, their father was. And so, do you know, in some ways, it helped the family to understand why I behaved like I did and the reasons behind it. Um, so, 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 in a way. You know, if on if I'd have only achieved that from it, it would have been well worth coming forward. And you're also achieving something fantastic now, Paul, with this safeguarding course, uh, which you know you you're very much prominent in. Can you just explain to people what it involves and how yeah, it is? Well, I, I sorry, John, but uh, I I work 
with the EFL now, and I go around the the EFL clubs delivering safeguarding workshops to the scholars, uh, to the coaches, to the parents, and and it's sort of an extension of the work that I've been doing uh, for for a long while now, but. It's something that I was passionate about when I was approached. Um, I believe that because of my experience, I could I could bring some lived experience to the course. I then I then reached out to some of my sporting colleagues um, to see if they would they would get involved uh, with me. Which, uh, to be honest with you, to a fault, I asked Lineker, we asked Brian Moore. You know, Marilyn Okoro mm. is a double Olympic champion. Uh, we asked Kevin Senfield. You know, the list goes on and they were just straight away, yes. So I believe that this course is is unique because it has the lived experience in there as well as the educational uh, side of it. I had total autonomy over what went in the course. And do you know what? I, I think I, I said something yesterday because it was launched yesterday on on social media that you know I've got I've got an FA Cup winners medal here I've got two championship medals and three England caps I said this course supersedes any of of them as far as achievements in, uh, for me because I know that I know that it'll help educate um, a lot of people across all sports it's it's grassroots sports it isn't just football because I didn't want to I didn't want to make it just a specific football um, course, and and you know the 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 feedback I've had has been absolutely fantastic, and I just hope I just hope that people um, people take it. You know, I'm in discussions with an awful lot of organisations who are looking at taking it on board, which for me would be great, would be great because. The more people it reaches, then for me, they will have a m more understanding about. And it's about all forms of abuse. It's not just about what happened to me. You know, we have, you know, we have emotional, we have racial, cyberbullying. So it's educating people and making them aware of of, of, of of what to look out for. Yeah. You know, how to deal with it, how to make sure you've got good practice in your grassroots club uh, recruitment. So it's. It's got everything in, I believe, that can 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 give people the confidence to work with children, knowing so, that they run the course. So, God forbid, you, you think this is still going on in certain areas. So, this is educating people to look out for it and look out for the worrying signs and to try and sort one thing, it. One thing I can say is that you know that, that we see a lot about racial abuse on, on TV, John, now with the England footballers. Um, it, you know, abuse is still going on. It's still going on. I mean, if you look at some of the stats, uh, they would be, they would flabbergast you. So, listen, I know that most people, um, most coaches, most parents, they, they, they work in grassroots sports because they love to do it and they do it for the right reasons. What there is, there's an element of individuals that don't do it for the right reasons. Now, if we put measures, protocols, policies in place that they know that they can't get by, then it makes it a whole lot safer, safer um, environment for, for children to pursue their dreams. All I want them to do is I don't want them to be like me. You know, I don't want them to to have the regrets I have that I'm talking to you about. Now, I want them to go, do you know what? I love my time playing football or playing netball or cricket at that uh, sports club. It was the best time in my life. And the same when I talk to the scholars, you know, in the EFL at the uh, academies, I, I say to them, you know what? I want you, I want you to enjoy your experience. And you know what? Your coaches and the staff here want you to go when you leave, whether you go on to play at the top, whether you go coaching or whatever line of work you do, they want you to go. Do you know what? I had the best time in my life them two years I had at Derby County, Fulham, wherever it might be. And that's that's what I try and impress on them. You know, there is support networks around you. You can go and talk to somebody, and that's whether it's something that's majorly important, or it might only be minor. It might be, you know, 
something and nothing that they want to get off the chest. But the important thing is they can get it off the chest and then they go into training and they, the only focus is they've got a smile on the face and the only focus is the session ahead. And, mm. and, and that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to impress on them when I go to the clubs. I mean, the, the, the kind of horror and indignation that followed the initial um, revelations of, of just what was happening or had happened around in those days, Paul, um, do, do you think it has, in a sense, flushed out the worst elements of, of these predatory um, paedophiles um, or, or are, are some, do you, do you fear, still lurking, you know, wait, waiting for their moment? It's, football has come on uh, leaps and bounds, giant strides in terms of safeguarding. I think what happened in 2016 was a wake-up call for that. Yeah. So all the measures are in place um, and you can never be 100% sure that they're keeping everyone out. But if you follow the measures and the procedures and the protocols, you're more likely to keep them out. When we look at other sports, uh, Neil, they haven't the infrastructure that football's got. They haven't got the resources that football's got. What these individuals are very clever at, they'll go to an organisation and they will, they will identify that these protocols and policies and procedures are not in place. They'll infiltrate and bit time they are found out, they've wreaked havoc. So this is why the course that I've, I've developed doesn't just, it isn't just about football because I know football is doing its utmost. And, and football can never be complacent because that's when you're at your most vulnerable. You think you've got everything right. That's when you're at your most vulnerable. But there's one thing for sure. These people are still out there and we've got to make sure that every sport uh, can be as safe as it possibly can by implementing uh, procedures and policies and protocol. And that's, that's what this course does. That's why it'll, it'll, it educates people around all of all areas of safeguarding which which will make will make them sit up and think i know that but and i think the fact that we've used real life people through the course and some of the darkest secrets footage that i was involved in engages them so they'll retain more information a lot of the yeah. courses are just tick box exercises this one is one that will engage with people and they will retain the information which is what you want very true. Um, also, it's true you get a certificate at the end of it, don't you, Paul? To yeah, and I'm fortunate. It's been endorsed by the NSPCC and the CPSU, right, which is a child protection in sport unit. Um, I'm looking at uh, at present other organisations getting behind it. So since it's been released, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I've been really busy, but I, I don't mind that. Um, I want it to be not just acknowledge but recognize that if you take this course then and you you pass the course because you've got to retain 75 percent to pass the course i don't right. you know it's not one of them where you've got three questions and if you answer oh. one wrong you go back and you've got two more you've got to retain the information but i want i want uh, national governing bodies to recognize it you know sport england emailed me yesterday they're gonna promote it on their website i'm having right. discussions I've had discussions with the PFA about uh, supporting it. Do you know what my ultimate goal would be, uh, John and Neil, is if I could get a major sponsor, because I don't care if it gets called the McDonald's Safeguarding yeah. in Sport course, um, we'll badge it up so I can then offer it to anyone in grassroots sports for, for free. I mean, we right. spent 18 months working and there's been a lot of work gone into it, so unfortunately it isn't something that we can offer free at the moment but my ultimate goal and my wish list would be that a major sponsor takes it on board badges it whatever however they want to badge it and we go there you go there's the course for free well let's hope somebody's listening that can do that mm. well if ever there was a greater cause for, for any company to get involved with surely there, yeah. there could be nothing better than this the protection Absolutely. of our children really is there that's what i think and you know i think and the exposure they'll get because you're talking about across all sports the amount of people that would be doing the course then you know and i'm talking here when i shouldn't be talking on a business level the exposure that they would get near would be would be oh. tremendous you know it'd be enormous and and 
So, you know, it's uh, hopefully, you know, keep working away at it and somebody will will see the potential in, in being able not only to protect children, which is the main thing, but have the business associated with something that that is worthwhile. Just just mentioning exposure there, um, Paul, there was this, the story yesterday, this young this young lad, Josh Carvalho in um, in Adelaide who um, became the first professional footballer to to to, to come out as, as gay and the the response across the um, the entire football world has been quite phenomenal uh, i mean here's a, a young lad who said he kept a secret for six years and it only finally by doing what he's done now can can he feel free of his of his demons uh, did, what what's what was your reaction when you heard and saw that to be honest with you i thought how brave how strong I know sometimes because they were used when I came forward, you know, and sometimes I, I look at it and say it wasn't brave, it wasn't strong. It was, you know, if I when I was 17, if I'd have come forward, that's brave and strong because I would have stopped the abuser to go on abusing more children. So I have I have regrets with that. When I look at this 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 young lad, um, that's a really brave decision. Now we know that footballers in the past have come out after they finished the career. But we haven't never had a footballer to 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 come to the forefront whilst he's still playing his football career. Now the spotlight's going to be on him. Um, he looks like, and I saw the interview. He looked like he can handle it, uh, which is a big thing, you know, because this is going to be massive. It won't just be 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 a football thing. It'll be a sport thing, and he will now be, you know. He's basically, I think, given up his own life in terms of the media. Uh, the media circus around him will be constant, but he looks strong enough, and I hope he is strong enough because it's a massive decision. You know, I came forward uh, myself and didn't really realise the implications and what would happen. He's the first footballer actually playing to come forward, so... I just hope he's got the right people around him in terms of his own mental health because it, it is a massive decision, but, a, a, you know, a massively brave decision as well. And I'm, 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 I'm pleased that somebody eventually has found the strength to uh, to come forward because, you know, it doesn't matter to any of us, does it? It doesn't matter what his sexuality is. You know, we're football supporters. You know, we, you know, when they're on the pitch, if they're not playing where we have a go, I mean, they're playing great. You say they're playing great. We don't really care about, you know, what the sexuality is. And that should be in 2021. What, what, what is the norm? The law of averages suggests there must be gay players in the, you know, Premier League or EFL. Do you think this will prompt any to come out or... Is this just this fear, you know, as you said before, Paul, it has been accepted. I think it will be accepted in football. But you have got, um, let's call it the banter from opposition crowds, haven't you? If we, if we can call it yeah, that. Yeah, and, and, and do you know what? You, you're right, John. You're going to have to be strong to take that. And no disrespect to, to the young man, but, do you know, I don't think Australian football is anything like the Premier League and the Championship and the EFL, um, you know that crowds will, or some crowds yeah. will, and, and a minority of them in the crowd will, will will have something to say. That, again, means that you have to be very brave. So I'm not so sure how many will come forward in the English game um, due to the fact that it's a totally different environment. And, and I hope they do. I hope they find the strength from the young man, but I'm not convinced at this moment in time. Well, and you, we, you actually look at you know in the in the days before social media and the uh, you know the, the horrors that, that sometimes that can, can can bring to to people's lives. You know, poor old Justin Fashion, you um, mm. you know, in the end, that the pressure on him was such that he took that he took his own life and. It's, yes. I think we had to bear in mind that, it, as you write, Paul, whoever does come forward in, in the kind of sometimes this cesspit that, that can be social mm -hmm. media, that they have the support there with them and they're not they're not isolated and vulnerable as, as could happen. You totally, because I'll tell you what, um, you and I know that there are people that go on social media still and use it as a platform to abuse 
individuals, even though it's against the law, but they manage to hide their identity. There'll be people that, that, that go on social media, I'm sure, if somebody comes out and, and, and says that they're gay in football. And that's the sad, that's the sad scenario surrounding this because the majority of us think that, that, that it's a brave, brave decision and that it doesn't make any difference. You know, it, you know, it really doesn't, but you've got that minority, Neil, that will, will use social media probably to abuse and, and, and wreak havoc. Uh, and, and you know what they don't do? They don't think of the individual. They don't care what effect it's having on that individual and that. That is so sad. We've also, of course, got a World Cup in Qatar who, you know, in the past haven't tolerated gays. You know, so mm. this is going to open up a discussion, isn't it? I mean, in some ways, it, it should help because it should highlight the situation. And, you know, it is, it is now normal, hopefully. But it, it, it does seem to contradict, you know, uh, the football senses, if you like. Yeah, no, and, and, and again, you know, we, we, we've heard an awful lot. You've, you've had the, the, the takeover that just happened at Newcastle yeah. where human rights was brought into question. Um, these, you know, I look at 2021 now, uh, John, and to think that other countries still suppress women, mm. still suppress people that are gay, uh, yeah. it, I, I find it totally bewildering. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe you know, other nations should put sanctions on them, you know, if they're if they're if they're going to to act in that manner then maybe you should look at them and, and put sanctions on them but uh, how how do you stop it if 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 that is the 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 beliefs of the country you know mm -hmm. it, it's just a very difficult scenario to be in but in this day and age it's bewildering you know you, I, I don't think women could drive cars in one of the countries mm -hmm. until maybe a year or two years ago they couldn't you know and it, I, I could make a joke about that, but I won't. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's disappointing, uh, to say the least. But, uh, you know, well done to the lad. Uh, I hope that it isn't too difficult with the media, media coverage that he gets. And then, you know, I hope he's got a support network around him because he will, he will encounter tough times because, you know... My story wasn't half as uh, half as big as his is going to be, and I still need the support around me from time to time. It's it's nice seeing you smile there, Paul. Do you, do you? Um, because it, it, it yeah, it, it is great. Because I mean, we we, we can only uh, you know be be well observers of what's gone on and and have our own thoughts about it. I mean, I can I can recall you know working in Manchester in those days, and you you kick yourself and think. It was happening almost under our eyes, and we didn't we didn't see it. Um, but at the same time, you've, you've you've come out the other side, so to speak, and and here you are, hopefully with your life in a, in, a, in a good place, which is you know so commendable, if if, if I may say. I, so. I, I I think you know when I look I look back, I'm, I think I'm a fighter. Don't get me wrong, I I, I still have the dark days, guys, and uh, you know sometimes I'm like one of them. Uh, one of them ducks on a pond where it looked like I'm yeah, just yeah. gliding across, but underneath, you know, I'm paddling like hell to survive. But I, I class myself as a fighter and, and, you know, I've had to come through a lot of adversity, you know, the last being losing my, uh, my wife uh, last September. And, you know, I, I sometimes do go, why me? But then I just go, I'll get on with it. I'll try and do the best I can. I'll do the best I can for her. And <coughs> yeah, she was obviously very supportive for you, Paul. Um, yes, I know you're very, sorry about you know bringing it to this, but no, no, it's it's fine, honestly, guys. I need to talk about it anyway. Um, but it's just it's hard, yeah, 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 but um. I'll echo what Neil says. You're a top guy who's who's doing a fantastic job now, and uh, I just regret giving you four out of ten once. 
<laughs> I, 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 was told was, I was told it was every week. I got you back with your two dinner. I got you back with your two dinner. <laughs> How are you? Hey, I was technical ability. For 90 minutes. All you had to do was press a button. <laughs> oh, well. oh, well. I, I, I failed miserably. <laughs> well, we got to talk again anyway, guys. And I'll tell you what, the, the great little reminder of those days when that, 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 that old um, column in the, in the Sunday People, it was Norman Wynn, wasn't it, who used to write that? Yeah. The, the, the column who's going where and there's has been an offer yeah. for so and so and as, as a daily newspaper now you used to pick that column up and, uh, and think wow what's uh you know what's what's norman going to come up with this week where's paul stewart going great stuff <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. and i'm not so sure how much of it was true john and you know they'd see it somebody in a stand with a west ham coach on and then they yeah. put two, and two together and come up with 12 wouldn't they so you know but players players did and i was one of them we still looked we still looked. Yeah. Well, I remember uh, going to Norman Wynn's funeral and uh, Richard Bott, who you know, yeah, used to work yeah, for Sunday Express, did, did his, did his to, eulogy and to, said that, um, oh, I always thought his name was Norman Wynn exclusive. Um, that's why CV goes up. <laughs> had, so we were ready. So many exclusive now, stories. Mike, I'm going to have to say I know, yeah. Now. No, great stuff. Well, Paul, we're absolutely delighted to to have had had uh, the opportunity to chat to you, and great to see you in um, you know in good spirits. And and, and let's let's get that sponsor. Well, welcome board, everybody huh? to another. Let's, um, let's do lunch let's with make me. Sure we, we can find she, someone I for you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, well, we uh, I don't know what Sam's doing, but he's making an offer. I don't know what he's doing, but I've, I've somehow managed to pick, flick the right button and shut him up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but listen, guys, it's been a pleasure again. Um, you know where I am. You need anything, yeah. you know. We'll be on next week. <laughs> see, you next, see you next Thursday, 11. I'll be doing it from Tenerife, though, on the golf course. <laughs> oh, very good. Very good, good stuff. stuff. Good stuff. Hey, Paul, been an Thanks, absolute Louis. pleasure. Thank you very Talk much about. indeed. All and the best. Cheers, cheers, mate. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thanks to Paul for a brilliant hour. And that's it for this week. The show was produced and edited and interrupted by Sam Sethi. Come back to the old Spice Boys next time. Follow us on your podcast app. And we're online at www.oldspiceboys.football. We'll catch you again soon. Sorry, chaps, I thought you'd finished. Fuck you now. You, kept, you came on at the end. We'll get here. You talking to somebody. Still yeah, live I, now, I, by the way. I was in the studio and I thought I thought you'd finished. The hour had gone. So I thought, oh, I'll just come and see if you... Are we, still live? Still, are we still live talking to people, by the way? Yeah, we are. Uh, yeah, we are. Let me just kill the live. Sorry about that swear word. <laughs>